Hi friend, welcome to Awarded Connection, a space created to learn, connect and multiply the power of a conversation to give visibility to the water industry. I'm Jess Borges, a passionate human that believes that you should increase your water curiosity. You're listening to episode one, the beginning of this journey. I'm joined today by the Honorable Carlene Maywell, who's going to help me understand what is the water industry. Carlene has dedicated her career to the sustainable management of water and improving access to water for all of us. She's currently the South Australian Water Ambassador, where she is focused on water policy advice, international water diplomacy, and supporting Australian water businesses to improve export opportunities. Welcome to our Water Connection, Carlene. Thank you, Jess. It's great to be here. Carlene, you have been involved in facing some of the biggest water challenges that Australia has had from multiple roles during your career. From your perspective and experience, what is the water industry? Well, it's many things. It's uh, it's many things and it's everything. Um, water enables us to do everything that we do in life. It it's underpins our economy. It underpins our well-being. It keeps us healthy, uh, and it uh, it drives um, you know the health of our ecosystems. Um, it's it's the most essential element on our planet. Yeah, next and to air. I guess air is just as important as water. That's true. That that could be. I'm sure there is an air industry there um, working, so we all have good quality air. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of like the different parties and the different people that are involved in the water industry, who else is involved in like making sure that we all get water and that water enables all the society parts that you have mentioned? Well, I think that the most important thing about water is, is, is it's not just about pipes and pumps, as you mis- mentioned. Water is about people and about how people respond, react and use water, um, not only for themselves, but for um, the world in which they live, their environment and uh, their local needs. And I think the, the complexity about water is it's really hard to understand um, for most people all of the different elements of water. For if you look at water in an urban context, it's it's about drinking water, it's about sanitation, it's about sewage management, it's about stormwater management, it's about greening our towns and our cities, um, it's about all of the things that we do in our recreation and tourism in regard to you know connection with water through boating, through fishing, through um, just enjoying going to the swimming pool. Uh, those are the sorts of things that um, the water is to to the average person. It's just always there. Uh, And always in the context of Australia, we're really fortunate that we turn on a tap 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that water is just there. And I think one of the things that I um, find most interesting about water is it's the hardest, I think, essential part of our life that we take no time to value or understand what it actually means for that tap to work every time we turn it on. The only time we think about water, really, in most in the most instances, is when the water doesn't come out of the tap. Most people don't know where it comes from. Most people don't know where it goes when you flush the toilet. And there's a whole connectivity from source to, to where it goes back into the environment um, that most people aren't aware of. And I think that's what fascinates me most about water. It's the only commodity also that... Um, that the managers of water are the only business that I know that's expected to sell more of their product and for less. Um, and it, 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 it you know, kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, most people think water is a human right and it should be free. And in actual fact, it is free. It falls from the sky from free. But if you want someone to actually go and collect it for you, store it and make it available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and to deliver it into your home, every single day, 24 hours a day, in fit for purpose, drinking water quality, there's a cost associated with that. And there's a cost associated with the pipes, the pumps, maintaining the environment in which the water is collected and sourced, and then a huge cost associated with cleaning it up after you're finished with it in your home and you flush it down the toilet or it goes down in the shower, down the drains, then it has to go back out into the environment. And so there's a really incredibly complex journey from the start to the finish in that cycle. Yeah, definitely. That that was the word that I was going for. Like, it's definitely water is a cycle, and and it's it's part of every part of 
of, of our society. Why do you think people don't know much about it? Is it because it has always been there and it has been part of all our evolution as a society and that's why it's just given for granted? Or why do you think people in general are not that conscious of where water is coming from and where is it going after we use it? Um, I think it's because the water sector is really good at the job that it does here in Australia. Um, and I think that we, it, we, we have done the job so well and we, we talk about it amongst ourselves and we don't talk about it um, um, more broadly um, outside our, our water industry. And that's why the conversations that you're having here, um, Jess, is so incredibly important. Um, the water sector needs to talk more uh, to other industry sectors and, and more broadly to the community about what it is that we do and to create a, a better understanding of the importance of the work that the water sector does in all its elements. And, you know, I've worked in water for over 25, probably 30 years. And in that space, I've met the most incredible people, really passionate people who are, you know, committed to the job that they do. And they're committed and passionate about every element of, of the work that they do. And yet, it's not a. It's not something that people think about, uh, and uh, and I, I'm you know I'm really excited about this this series that you're doing simply because making the conversation broader than just the water sector is so incredibly important because where there's a water issue, where there's a water problem, you can you can guarantee there's people, and it's about how you engage with people and how you change people's behaviour to water that you get reform in how we manage water and how we think about water and how we value it. And when we value it, we can then manage it better because we will appreciate the value of it, we'll be prepared to pay for it, and therefore we can manage it better. Yeah, I think you touched on a very important point there with people uh, being that um, an essential part of this industry. You recently co-led a project with the Australian Water Partnership called Community Voices, looking deep into the role of community in the community engagement in major water projects through a series of interviews. So. This document highlights the complexities existent in the water industry, demonstrating that um, it's not only about pipes and pumps, as we have we have talked about, but what were the main learnings in that sense, I guess, rounding up from what you have said, like people might not value water that much, but what else did you learn from this project that we should be doing as, a, as an industry? Well, I think um, what I learned from it is you can, you can virtually work out where someone's from by the way they talk about water. Everyone looks upstream with envy and downstream with disdain. Uh, and there's um, very little um, concept uh, that people don't think about in the context of its, its whole, the whole system, the whole cycle of water. They think about it in the context of where they are and how it is impacting upon them. And we need to have those broader conversations to actually share our knowledge about the system so that people can be better informed. And to be better informed, I don't mean that by, you know, people coming out from Canberra or from Adelaide and telling people in the regions that are living and breathing um, the water environment of our rivers and telling them what they think they should be doing. It's about really deeply engaging people, understanding, you know, their value of water, their culture, what drives them, what's, what's, what's the importance of water in their life, and then introducing them to the importance of water in other people's lives, in different parts of, of a river basin, for example. And having those conversations between people who are upstream and people in, who are downstream, who can share their life's connection to water, their culture around water, their value of water, you'll get better conversations, better understanding, and then better thinking about what we need to do to, to manage water better. Um, I think we've got to stop thinking about problems in water as an, uh, as an engineering issue that we need to solve, a problem that needs to be solved. It's really about how we engage with communities, with people, create leadership in the space that's at the local level, at you know the state level, at the national level, that truly engages with the whole water cycle. And I think that's how we make change. It's about people change as much as it is about engineering solutions. I think you touched on a really important point, like when you were saying like how people think about upstream and downstream. Um, I guess that happens as well with engineering problems. Sometimes, well, I'm an engineer, sometimes we get a problem and you're so focused on solving only that little bit that you have that you don't get the view to or the vision to actually look into how is this affecting upstream, how is this affecting downstream. And like if, if we don't do it as an industry um, that we work on solving these problems, then we can't really ask people in the broader community to to do it as well. So 
What else do you think is important in the water industry beyond those technical skills that we all learn at university and we go out? What else is it needed for, for professionals that are in the industry to, to touch on these and to improve? I think there's many things that are really important to understand when managing water. Uh, and as I said, it's, it's as much about behavioural change as it is about finding engineering solutions or technical solutions to problems. Uh, and, you know, we often send engineers out to engage with communities and it's really not the skill set that engineers have. Engineers build things. Engineers are very good at fixing problems. That's what they're trained to do. That's what you're trained to do, Jess, in your role as an engineer. You're not actually trained in the skills of community engagement and behavioural change. That's a specialist field and it's a really challenging field and it requires really deep understanding and capability in um, that social science of behavioural change. And yet we don't match our engineers up with social scientists to go out and work with communities. Um, we, we send people out and uh, um, to, to tell communities about these wonderful engineering solutions that we've decided is best for them um, without having the skills that enable them to really truly engage with those communities or understand what are going to be the drivers for change for those communities. And so I think we have to think about water more holistically. I think we need to think about solving problems and that, that behavioural change that's necessary that goes alongside implementing engineering solutions in a different way and bring in that skill set to work with our water policy uh, people, with our engineers uh, and with our communities. And I think we'd have a much better outcome if we took that path. I think you're absolutely right. Um, in in terms of who are the professionals that are in the water industry, it shouldn't be limited to people with the technical kind of skills in, in engineering because we it's so broad. This this industry, what I've, I've been picking up from the conversation we're having, is like it touches on the society in so many ways that it's impossible that only from a technical and engineering perspective we can solve all those problems. And I think that's kind of what the report of this Community of Voices uh, project was coming up or was trying to to summarize with the six principles that should be considered for effective community engagement. It's like a little bit of a starting guide into broadening our perspectives into using and solving problems for the water industry, not only from a technical perspective. So I encourage you that are listening to this to look at all of these six principles and reflect on how they can be used into de your day-to-day -day job. I'll make sure that I'll leave the link in the no in the show notes for you to have a look at. Um, and yeah, as you touch on, Carlene, like with with the education that we get, it would be amazing and we might touch on this in the future into what is the other things that we should be teaching up in universities so our professionals are getting into the water industry are getting a more holistic education and not only through a certain lens, which with experience you get exposed to all the different angles, but if you have a broader vision from the beginning, then um, that certainly could be very beneficial for the industry as a whole. Following on this, um, what do you think is the role of young water professionals? Like, what can we do as young water professionals for the future of the industry, taking these learnings on board? Well, I, I would certainly encourage young water professionals uh, to become more than just young water professionals, um, to be to take a broader perspective on this and become professionals across industry sectors, um, to seek to understand industry sectors. What drives the agriculture sector that uses most of the water that's um, that's extracted from our rivers and our, our underground water systems? Um, why, why is it that um, in that sector it can be so difficult to introduce change? Um, what do we need to do to engage with those communities to ensure that we can help them to be the best that they can be in their water use, uh, to improve their water use, to improve their productivity? Think about it in the whole sense of, of why they're using that water, which is in the production of food or the production of, of something that's agricultural or horticulture or, you know, viticulture. Um, they're very passionate, uh, the people who use water and are um, licensed to take water from our systems are really passionate about it and we need to understand why they're passionate about it and what their angle is on this as well. Um, the agriculture sector plays a big role in, um, in caring for our environment um, because they're the ones that are closest to it but they're also the ones that are, are often given the hardest time in regard to um, how 
the broader community thinks about water. Um, you take the basin plan, for example, that's one of the biggest policy shifts that this nation has ever seen. And we've done it in a 10 year period. Um, you know, since the basin plan is probably 15 years since we started down the path of the basin plan. Massive, massive change has occurred in the water sector. And yet, what you hear about it is just the, what people perceive as the failings, and yet there has been so much achieved, and people have made so much change. And in the beginning, it was it was an agenda that was looking at water reform, and it, then it had to become so much more than water reform. It became rural and regional restructure. It became societal change. It became a whole range of other things that had to occur to enable us to get to where we are now. And it'll certainly take a lot more effort in that social and economic space to go the last mile to deliver this round of the basin plan, but then to actually look at what phase two looks like. Yeah, it's very important um, also to touch on um, for people that might not be familiar with what this basin plan is, can you give us a definition so we're on the same page on what this basin plan is? Yeah, that's a good question, Jess. Uh, I've assumed knowledge there. The, um, the basin plan um, was um, a water initiative that uh, the Australian nation, um, I guess, embarked upon back in 2007. It was um, an announcement from the federal government that they were going to invest 10 billion and then it turned into 13 billion dollars in reforming the Murray Darling Basin uh, and that the federal government was going to take an active role and step in uh, in the management of water across boundaries. Um, formerly uh, under our constitution nationally um, the federal government doesn't have control over management of water. The state governments retain that responsibility and they've worked uh, for the last I don't know, 150 odd years through, through intergovernmental agreements in the Murray Darling Basin which have taken us so far along a water reform journey and we've done some really good things historically in that area but progress was slow and it was very, very difficult to get agreement on really tough, uh, insurmountable problems such as over allocation of water out of the basin, which was putting stress on everyone, including the environment, uh, and was unsustainable in the long run and it needed to be addressed. Um, so part of the reform process was to develop a whole of basin plan to set new sustainable diversion limits out of the system, to determine what the environment needed um, to sustain the environment that then could sustain everyone's take from the environment in a sustainable way. Uh, and it's been a really hard journey because it's meant, it's meant actually making very, very tough decisions to take water out of production and then apply it in a different way to manage the environment. And so it's probably been the most ambitious water reform journey in the world. Uh, and what Australia has managed to do is to make step change in addressing over allocation in a basin scale um, that's never been seen anywhere else in the world. Uh, so it's, it's been an incredible um, reform journey. It started in 2007 and it is still ongoing today and is still as contentious today as it was back in 2007. It's a really challenging water space and it actually demonstrates everything that's really complex about water. It has those upstream, downstream water issues to deal with. It has different um, communities of interests that and vested interests in, in the take of water. It has mining, water for mining, water for towns and cities, water for agriculture, um, water for tourism, water for the environment. They're all there and they're all competing for, for one precious and um, not uh, it's a limited resource. It's not a resource that's limitless and it has been treated as if it is limitless in the past. And the Basin Plan has endeavoured to redress that. Uh, it's come a long way and it's still got a long way to go. Um, many people around the world look at Australia and wonder how we got to where we are in our water management. Not every river basin system has water licensing. Not every river basin has um, even water accounting that understands how much water there is, how much is being taken, who's taking it, what's it being used for, who's polluting it. Um, all of those sorts of things don't happen in most river basins around the um, will happen in uh, happening in around the world, but not to the extent in the management that Australia has put in place in the basin plan. So it's a really incredibly fascinating area. Absolutely, yeah. As you say, I think it's one of those examples that is probably showing the complexities of the industry. And yes, there would be technical people doing the specific things, but like, how do you 
take a step back and look at broadly and also see, for example, how politics and how Australian being a federal government is also like, it would um, influence how this this works because in other countries maybe it's more a centralized government, which does not mean that it would work better or worse. It's just a different solution. But um, certainly it's a, it's a topic that we would like to dig it more into. We're planning another episode on going into the basin plan, um, so stay tuned for that. But certainly, as you say, is is a very clear example just to open up the conversation on how complex these industries and how the different uses of water are competing most of the time for a limited resource and something that we have thought that is uh, unlimited and is not and it's also changing every year so the, the water that comes comes in or flows through that river as an example wouldn't be the, the same I imagine so that puts a lot of stresses into how people use it do you think that's that's the case? It certainly is, and it's interesting because um, the, the Murray-Darling Basin in Australia is one of the most variable river basins in in the world also, and so in managing in an environment where there is such unpredictability about the availability of, of water between dry seasons and wet seasons, um, you know, floods and and, um, and droughts are a, a natural thing in, in the system, and having to manage those extremes and present it as a, um, a continuous supply for most people is, is quite really... Um, a challenging policy area, and, and I think you're quite right. But the basin plan has everything. It ha- it's that it's a transboundary water management. Um, the states of Australia may as well be different countries when it comes to managing water, and the stakes are very, very high um, for every jurisdiction in regards to how they want to hold their power over the water in their jurisdictions. And so um, not only the stakes high, but the, the politics is is very intense. And once again, it comes back to, to people and how you negotiate in that environment. And there's so many elements to it. If you, if you look at um, the water sector uh, and um, its, its players, there's, there's competition, contestability and conflict everywhere you look. And it's not just in communities. It's not just upstream, downstream. It's not just between states. It's within states. It's within communities upstream and downstream of Lock 1 in Australia. I mean, in South Australia, on the Murray-Darling Basin. Upstream of Lock 1, they think very differently to people who live downstream of Lock 1. You also look at your, your different government agencies. They all have different agendas. Um, and the economic agencies, such as those that want development and want industry growth, the energy sector wants water. The energy sector is demanding more um, renewable sources of water, and many of those are reliant upon water. If you look at hydropower as, as one example, that requires water and lots of it, and that can change when the demand for water is needed. And, and so, therefore, it puts pressure on other um, parts of the system that need water at different times than energy needs water. You look at hydrogen as, as a new future renewable water that, um, um, energy source. That's going to depend on water. You look at any of the future mining opportunities, that depends on water. Uh, and, and so you've got all of these competing demands and you've got competing demands within government agencies. So the agricultural department doesn't agree with the mining department and certainly both of them don't agree with the environment department. And so you've, you've got conflict even within government agencies that need to mm-hmm. be resolved in a political and a, a contested way. Um, so wherever you look in the water sector, you see contestability and conflict um, that needs to be resolved. So negotiation is one of the greatest skills. And that's why um, I um, like to use the term water diplomacy, because that's what you're doing. When you're walk, working in the water sector, you're not just building technical solutions to problems. You're building an environment where diplomacy drives the change necessary to come up with solutions that include trade-offs, that include um, how you compensate for when the trade-offs unjustly impact upon one sector against another sector. And that's why politics is so important in dealing with water because at some point in the cycle, those trade-offs have to be managed, those impacts need to be well-considered and compensated where necessary, where there are unjust outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I think this conversation has been invaluable to just understand all the different actors and we didn't even touch in all of the actors, but it's just amazing how, yeah, how complex and how dynamic our industry is. And, and it's interesting that we have the opportunity to see it from a different perspective. Carleen, why do you work in the water industry? I 
like most people, once you get involved um, with the water sector, it's very hard to leave it. Uh, it. I'm passionate about it because no two days are ever the same. Uh, the things that I'm doing in the water sector, you know, from, from when I first got elected to Parliament to then being, you know, appointed a Cabinet Minister, then working at the national level at, um, as Chair of the National Water Commission, and now as the South Australian Water Ambassador, working in different countries, helping them on their water reform journeys, um, uh, means that um, my life is very rich and very full, and it's faced with fantastic challenges every single day uh, and I'll never be out of a job <laughs> I, I guess I'll put it that way because there's so much to do and there's so much to do around the world I'm recently working with the Australian Water Partnership in Thailand and in Vietnam and the challenges in those countries is they, they seek to introduce um, national water laws that will start them on a journey towards proper water accounting, proper water sharing of water, consideration of the environment, engaging with all of those issues that we've talked about um, throughout this interview and, and working with those countries in, in challenging environments where they've got, you know, hundreds of millions of people and, um, you know, trying to introduce a change at a national level and then get that to roll out in places like India. You know, it's just, it's just mind-blowing the size yeah. of the challenge that the globe has to meet. And so, so I'm passionate about work, working in the water industry. I get up every morning and I'm really excited about what today holds. I'm really hopeful that we can all make a change. And I think just, you know, every little bit that everyone does adds to the story. And, and this is why what you're doing in creating a conversation that's outside the water sector, that's for the water sector, but out to engage with those sectors that are not the water sector is so incredibly important. Yeah, I think so. And, and clearly you, you are an inspiration, Colleen. Like if you wake up every day very excited about what you do, that's exactly how I feel as well. And and that is the purpose of this um, series of conversations that we can inspire the young water professionals and other people that may not be involved in the water industry might want to come and jump and help us in some of the problems that we have. Thank you very much for your time today, Colleen. You share so much knowledge and important reflections with us today. We certainly now know a little bit Bit more about what the water industry is and what are the complexities that are there and in further episodes we'll be dealing into specific things to try to understand this a little bit further you clearly are an inspiration thank you very much thank you jess and what a wonderful initiative good luck with it thank you <laughs> thank you and to you my friend that are listening thank you very much for tuning in and listening to the first episode or of our water connection i hope you enjoyed the ride um follow us on linkedin um, as our water connection and in twitter or x as our water connect to hear all the updates and new episodes coming until the next time